give objective advice, and some of you will likely also be in the role of an advocate. And I say advocate, I don't mean in the narrow criminal law sense, I mean in the broader sense, uh, as uh, representing parties in civil litigation or uh, in criminal cases, either one. Uh, and most of the, of the 10 rules that I uh, uh, would like to talk about apply equally, uh, and, and I will see some ob obvious situations in which one might not quite apply, but I think most of the 10 rules of legal writing that I'm about to uh, offer to you apply equally to writing in terms of advocacy and the writing as a counselor or as an academic. And, uh, I'll have to admit that some of my proposed 10 rules uh, reflect my bias as a judge. For instance, and, and, and by the way, these are perhaps in a logical order, but not necessarily in order of importance. You can decide for yourself which rules are more important, and in some situations, some of my suggested rules may be more important than others. Uh, but in at least in some logical order. Rule number one, and this does reflect my bias as a judge, if you can see the way things stack up on my desk for me to read. Uh, briefs from lawyers, uh, memoranda from my law clerks. Uh, you'll understand why rule number one is this, and some academics may not agree with this. Rule number one is this, shorter is better. Shorter is better. Uh, and here's, here's the reason. Uh, shorter is better than longer because if you're writing something that you consider to be important, <coughs> if you're writing something that is important for your client or for the company that employs you or for the agency that employs you, if it's, if it's important, then it's probably going to be read by busy people. And if it's important enough to be read by busy people, then those busy people want you to get to the point. Uh, I, uh, I'll tell you right now, a brief that, that makes the point that needs to be made in 15 pages is a more persuasive document than a brief that makes the same point in 25 or 30 pages. Uh, now, I, I read some law review articles and uh, uh, other legal materials in which it appears that the author prided himself or herself on taking 100 pages to say something that could have been said in 20. So there are those who think apparently that longer is better. Uh, in the real world, my suggestion to you is shorter is better than longer, as long as you can make your point adequately. And also, that, uh, very often, uh, putting your thoughts in writing concisely, be it in an academic writing or a memo for counseling purposes or in, uh, an advocacy as in a brief, very often making your, your, your document shorter requires some rewrite. Uh, there was a Supreme Court justice uh, who once recorded in some of his correspondence, it was, I believe, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes writing to Justice Cardozo, if I'm not mistaken. If I had more time, I would write you a shorter letter. And, uh, <clears throat> and there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, so at the risk of overemphasizing rule number one, let me tell you that rule number one is foremost in my mind nearly every day. Uh, number, two, number two, and this really does apply, I think, in, in both academic writing and writing for purposes of giving objective advice and for purposes especially, uh, especially in uh, advocacy type writing, and that is uh, in advocacy writing especially, you are not there, you're not writing to prove how smart you are you are writing to persuade the reader that your position or your client's position is correct. And if you get hung up on proving how smart you are, uh, then uh, it's entirely possible that the reader will be just a little bit put off by your tone and you will lose much of the persuasive value of what you're writing. Uh, my, 
my rule of thumb, and, and admittedly this does not apply universally, but my rule of thumb is this. If I'm writing something more like writing something like this, and I have used a word that might well cause the reader to reach for the dictionary, find another word. You're not trying to prove how smart you are. You're not trying to prove how many words, how many fancy words you know. You're trying to persuade. And if your reader has to reach for the dictionary, uh, then you have interrupted the train of thought. So if you think that you use, if you use a word in your first draft that might cause the reader to reach for the dictionary, find another word. You're not, you're not trying to prove how smart you are. Uh, next, number three, and this really applies uh, mostly to advocacy writing, writing briefs for, for uh, trial courts or appellate courts. Uh, and this, uh, this is easy to lose sight of. And, and the, the, the premise for what I'm about to say is this. Uh, as a lawyer immersed in a case, you've been working on your case for weeks or a month, months. Your client has informed you of all the facts, you've studied the facts, you understand what the case is about, you understand the, the claims that are asserted and the defenses that are asserted in the case. And then some little issue comes up that requires the judge to make a decision about some aspect of the case. It could be procedural, it could go to the merits of the case, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, so you write a brief, you write a motion and a brief. And you write your brief explains why the court should rule your way on a particular issue. First, at the beginning of your brief, give the judge some context. Uh, explain briefly, before you get to the this precise point you're talking about, explain briefly what the case is about. You know what the case is about, but this is only one of maybe a hundred or more cases that the judge has to worry about. So give the judge some context. Uh, give the judge a little bit of factual context, even though uh, maybe you're, you're giving a little more context than, than the, the exact issue at hand requires. Give the judge some factual context. Give the judge uh, some understanding of what the basic claims are. You don't need to take more than maybe two-thirds of a page to do that. But very often, uh, on procedural issues, especially issues of discovery of information, whether one side is producing the information that it's supposed to. Uh, very often on procedural issues where I have a brief and I'm, I'm required to read this brief and then that brief and then the rule, uh, very often I'll pick up the opening brief and it will get right into the heart of the issue without reminding me what is this case about? What is the context in which this arises? Uh, now that cuts a little bit, I suppose, against rule number one, shorter is better. But a little bit of an exception to rule number one is take the time to give the judge some context. What this is all about, why this, what this case is about, what the basic claims are, what the basic facts are, uh, before, before you get to, to the, the exact issue at hand. You're doing the judge a favor because one thing that, that will slow down the process and perhaps even be a little bit irritating is I have, to, if I have to look at some other document in order to orient myself and get some understanding of what the case is about. Uh, so, as I said, rule number three, explain the context at least to the extent of telling the judge a little bit about the basic facts, the basic contentions, basic claims, and, and who the parties are. Uh, rule number four should probably be rule number one if we're talking about order of importance. Uh, and if it was rule number one, then I would probably repeat it as rule number ten. And that is, there is never, ever any excuse for misrepresenting the facts. Uh, and so often in advocacy, we see either outright misrepresentations of the facts or more, more frequently misleading descriptions of the facts. Well, don't forget, we've got an adversary system. Uh, we've got an adversary system in Russia and in the United States and in most other countries. And 
if you fudge the facts, uh, even short of outright misrepresentation of the facts, if you fudge the facts, then you're going to pay a price when the other side sets the record straight. Uh, and this is related to another rule that I'm coming to. But uh, whether we're talking about outright, flat out misrepresentations of facts, or just running along that, that gray line and fudging the facts, there is never, ever any excuse for misrepresenting the facts. How do, how, so how do you, how do you uh, uh, write about contested facts? Uh, if you're writing about facts that you expect to prove or that you expect the evidence will show, then my suggestion is that you should put it that way. Uh, rather than representing that something is an outright indisputable fact. Uh, if you are writing about facts that uh, the evidence may or may not show or, or the evidence may or may not establish, then make sure that the court understands that this is an issue that is in controversy. Uh, if, you're, if you're writing about a procedural issue, perhaps what information has been produced uh, and what information has not been produced. Maybe you're complaining that the other side has not <coughs> produced information that's supposed to be produced. That sort of procedural issue, it is especially important to be absolutely accurate on the facts. Uh, not so very long ago, I had two lawyers in front of me. A big squabble over whether information documents had been produced that were supposed to be produced. One lawyer said, yes, they've been produced. The other lawyer was saying, no, they have not been produced. I finally had them both come to the lecture. And I had them both raise their hand. And I said, I'm going to have you answer my questions under oath, which is virtually unheard of for a judge to require lawyers to do that. I'm going to have you answer my questions under oath. And whichever one of you turns out to be not telling me the truth, I'm going to refer you to the United States Attorney for Prosecution for Perjury. And uh, they said, well, can we take a little recess? <laughs> and I said, sure. Uh, and 15 minutes later, they sent my bailiff a message that they had resolved the problem. So uh, again, uh, I, I, really, I really do think that uh, uh, the uh, the imperative of being right on the facts, especially on those procedural issues that can be a little bit irritating, uh, is pretty important. Uh, one one uh, a friend of mine, for whom I have great respect, uh, uh, put it to me this way. Uh, other people can take away your money. Other people can take away your property. Other people can even take away your health or even your life. But nobody can take away your integrity. You have to give them. Don't give your integrity to them. Only you control that. And that really is, goes to the heart of my advice to you when I say there is never ever an excuse for misrepresenting the facts. Uh, there's a related issue, a little bit different in some ways, but a related issue, and this, this applies uh, very much in advocacy writing. And we see it in American courts, we see it way too much. Uh, we probably see it a little more among less experienced lawyers than among more experienced lawyers. But if you're writing a brief uh, and uh, the contentions are flying back and forth, don't get personal. Personal attacks on opposing counsel, for instance, on matters that don't have a thing to do with the merits of the case or the merits of the issue before the court. They're just irritating. They make me want to lay a brief down and go on to something else. Uh, because I've, I've been at this nearly 50 years, and I know that the practice of law is demanding and that people are irritating. And sometimes uh, your opposing counsel doesn't play entirely fair, uh, or that your opposing counsel has done something else that might, might, might uh, tempt you to get personal uh, in a brief. Keep your, your writing big, uh, and this is obviously more so in advocacy writing, 
keep it professional, keep it relevant, keep it to the point, and avoid the temptation to insert personal attacks into your advocacy writing. Because I think, I, I know a pretty good handful of Russian judges, and I think my Russian colleagues would agree with me, that when, when you read a brief that, that has a few lines, even a few lines of personal attack, it just makes you want to lay that brief down and go on to something else. Uh, the, the next rule, this is, we're up to rule number six now, and I haven't gotten any questions. Remember, there's no such thing as bad question. Uh, we're up to rule number six, and this, this is a little bit, uh, a little bit of, a, of an elusive concept, but I think it's important. Uh, I, I suspect it's as true in Russia as it is in the United States that when you're writing a brief uh, explaining your client's position to a court, uh, the first thing you do is you start out with the, the facts that are relevant to that issue, maybe after you've provided the overall context, as I've said. Then you write the, about the facts that are relevant to this particular issue. Your statement of facts, and, and, and here, here's the key to this, by the way. The judge knows the law, presumably, and most of the time they do. The judge knows the law, but the judge, judge does not know the facts of your case. Uh, so when you write your statement of facts in a brief, you should craft that statement of facts so that, first of all, it's accurate but craft it in such a way, and you might want to write it and then look at it later. Craft your statement of facts in such a way that the judge, after reading just that part of your brief, before he or she gets to the discussion of the law, write your statement of facts in such a way that by the time he or she gets through that part of your brief, he, he or she will also already have a pretty good idea as to what the outcome will be. Because the judge knows the law as he or she reads the brief. And, and where you talk about the law in your brief, unless it's a, a novel issue or something that's uh, very uncertain, that's probably not the decisive part of your brief. So craft your statement of facts in such a way that by the time the reader gets through that part of it, the reader is all, already leaning in the, in the direction that you suggest. Uh, and uh, and that, that requires, uh, as I call it, some craftsmanship, because, first of all, your statement of facts has to be accurate. It cannot fudge the facts. But you can give appropriate emphasis to the facts that are favorable, give appropriate emphasis to the facts that are decisive from your perspective and try to craft your statement of facts in such a way that the reader already has an inclination even before they get to the argument part of the brief. Uh, rule number seven, and this applies, uh, I think, uh, uh, both in advocacy writing and in writing for the purpose of providing counsel and legal advice, uh, but perhaps more so in advocacy writing. Know your audience. Uh, if you're before a, uh, or an oblast court judge or a Wyoming court judge, uh, then you're, you have an audience of one, that judge. Uh, when I, uh, when I'm a district judge, I, I don't have to get anybody to agree with my decision, unlike the appellate courts. So I, I sit there by myself and I make my decision. So I'm an audience of, of one when lawyers write briefs for me. And it's passing strange, especially in an area of the law where I have done considerable writing for a lawyer, and I'm from Oklahoma City, so maybe a lawyer will come from Dallas or maybe from Chicago or from Houston, and they'll write a brief on an issue that I've done a fair amount of writing on without citing any of the things that I've written. Well, I'm pretty proud of the things that I've written. Most judges are pretty proud of the things that they have and if your judge has done some writing on a particular issue in other cases or even academic writing, learn about that before you even start to write. Know your audience. It's, it's a subtle way, perhaps not so subtle way, of appealing to the ego uh, 
and judges do have egos, of appealing to the ego of your judge. Because they tend to be pretty proud, or at least pretty firmly set on things that they have put in writing about legal issues. Uh, in, in the United States, uh, for the last 20 or 25 years, uh, there has been uh, a new subset of litigation uh, in civil cases and in some criminal cases uh, called what we call Daubert motions, where one side or the other challenges the qualifications of expert witnesses that one side or the other, that the opposing party plans to call. And uh, uh, asserting that the, the, uh, the opposing party's expert witness does not have the qualifications to render opinions or that the methodology used by the opposing party's expert uh, is uh, flawed and faulty methodology. Those are called Daubert motions, asking the judge to exclude the proposed testimony of the other side's expert. Well, I've done a fair amount of writing in that, and uh, frankly, the first thing I do when I open a, a look at the brief and look at the table of authorities in the brief on a Daubert motion is to see if they have the good judgment to cite back to me some of the cases where I've already rendered Daubert decisions. Uh, and uh, of course, local lawyers uh, uh, know enough to uh, uh, basically work from the basis of the writing that I've already done. It's easy enough for lawyers from out of town to do with electronic legal research, but uh, my, my suggestion is know your audience. Uh, I'm not interested in what, judge, what some judge from New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or Dallas has said on a given issue. If I've already done some writing on that issue, I'm pretty likely to stay with what I've already written. Uh, rule number eight, and uh, uh, this is really goes, in my view, to the heart of advocacy, and that is Every case that, that is seriously contested in any court, both sides will have some weak spots in their case. Uh, what we call tender spots. Issues that, that could cause you to lose the case. If a case gets very far and is seriously contested, there will be weak spots, tender spots, for both sides. Uh, don't ignore, in your legal writing, or for that matter in the courtroom, don't pretend, don't wish away, don't pretend that those weak spots are not there. They're there. If it's a seriously contested case, yes, there are weak spots. Uh, and uh, deal with them head on. This is a form of candor. Candor is very persuasive. Uh, deal with the weak spots in your case head on. Uh, the, primary, the prime example I can give you of that is, uh, and, it, and sometimes it takes a little bit of experience for a lawyer to feel, to have the confidence to do this, but you can do this as, uh, as easily as a 25-year-old lawyer as, as you, you can as a 50 or 55-year-old lawyer. That lawyer uh, stands in front of him, and, and he, this was pretty much echoing what he put in his brief. He stood up in front of me on a seriously contested issue in a pretty good sized case. And he said, Judge, there's three ways I can lose this case. And here's why I shouldn't lose this case on any of these three issues. And then he proceeded to discuss head on the weak spots in his case and why those weak spots should not be decisive. And I have to tell you, that's probably the most persuasive opening, opening comment I have ever heard. Judge, there's three ways I could lose this case, and here's why none of these issues should be decisive. And that got my attention. It really did. That's very good advocacy. That's, that's candor. Uh, that's your showing that you are uh, addressing the issues head on. Uh, and that, uh, that even engenders a certain feeling of appreciation in the judge. Here is a lawyer willing to deal head on with the weak spots in the case. Uh, so I, I really do suggest to you that uh, uh, that that degree of candor is, is not only is it is it not damaging to you, 
in, in almost every instance can be very helpful to you. Uh, rule number one, rule number nine, should be rule number one. And I, I, feel, I feel very strongly about this. I realize that sometimes deadlines are pressing in on you. Uh, I call it the 24-hour rule. If at all possible, finish your piece. Finish writing it. Lay it down. Don't look at it for at least 24 hours, if not 48 hours, and then go back to it before you file it or before you submit it for publication, whatever. If you lay it down, and, and, and this takes a certain amount of discipline, this means that you have to finish it at least 24 hours before it's due. Or for, better yet, 48 hours. But if you lay it down for 24 hours, or better yet, 48 hours, and then pick it up a day or two later, you will be amazed at the things you missed or you, you didn't write exactly uh, the way that you should have. The things that need to be clarified. Uh, it, it, maybe this is uh, just my own fault as a bad writer, but. Uh, uh, really, when, I, when I'm writing a long, a, a long order, and as long as there's no time pressure, and, and I get to pretty much set the schedule myself, uh, as long as there's no time pressure, I will lay it down and pick it up at least a day later. And on any given page of what I write, I'll make two or three changes. I don't care if it's three pages longer or 25 pages long. Uh, you'll just really surprise yourself at the changes you will yourself to include are necessary if you go by the 24-hour rule. The point is, your product will be a better, more polished, more professional product if you lay it down and then pick it up. Rule number 10 is related to rule number 9, and that is uh, avail yourself of every opportunity before you submit your piece, whether it's a brief, whether it is academic writing, or whether it is counsel. Uh, rule number 10 is, if at all possible, have somebody else read it. Uh, and there's a little bit of a twist to that. Have somebody review it for you. Uh, and uh, be, get the benefit of their thoughts. I've got two law clerks, uh, very bright lawyers, very good writers. Uh, they're probably both better writers than I am. They've been with me for 18 years, and they're, they're, they're willing to push back when they think I'm headed in the wrong direction. They're willing to push back if they think I have uh, not said something exactly right. And if, so if I'm writing something myself, I won't file it uh, until one of my law firms has reviewed it for me. Uh, but uh, another another approach to that, and I think this really does have a lot of merit. Uh, when I was in the practice of law, as I was for 29 years before I went on the bench, uh, when I wrote a really, really important brief, uh, believe it or not, and I, and I, and I really commend this to you, when I wrote a really, really important brief, after I had obeyed the 24-hour rule myself, I would take it home and give it to my wife, who is not a lawyer. And I would ask her to read the brief from beginning to end. You wouldn't believe some of the things that she would find. Uh, and it's every, every single suggestion she would make would be an improvement. Uh, some things that are not adequately explained, uh, some things that are confusing, some things that are awkwardly stated, you know, right down to punctuation for that. Uh, but my wife's not a lawyer. She's a retired kindergarten teacher. Uh, at the time that I was doing this, she was not a retired kindergarten teacher. She was an active kindergarten teacher. Uh, and I would take a 20, 20 or 25 page brief home to her and say, look, this is due tomorrow or the next day, whatever. Could you just give this a review for me? And I was consistently amazed at the things that she found totally correct that needed to be fixed in my work. Uh, so uh, I think it's at least as valuable sometimes to have a non-lawyer read your piece 
as it is to have a legally trained person read your case. Uh, because whoever ultimately reads it, whether they're a lawyer or not, uh, is going to be reading it starting fresh. They're not going to be immersed in the subject the way you are. They're going to be starting from scratch. And just like my wife starts from scratch when she would read all my briefs. Uh, now, I can't, as a judge, I can't do that because nobody outside of my chambers can know about an order before it's filed. So my law clerks do the same thing, and they obviously were lawyers. But uh, you would really be surprised at, at uh, the, the, the things that, that you will be put on to if you just have somebody else, even a non-lawyer, or perhaps especially a non-lawyer, read your case. Uh, folks, those are my ten rules, and you haven't asked a single question. I, I don't know how much. <laughs> admiring the language. <laughs> it's relaxing and listening. To uh, <laughs> well, let's have some questions. Uh, there is no such thing as a bad question. We have some uh, a gentleman here from uh, uh, who uh, originally from the UK and from the Netherlands. Perhaps they can participate as well. Uh, I, I, I solicit your questions. I really do. Yes, sir. I get the question. May, may I ask? Sure. Uh, Your Honor, sometimes uh, I'm a lawyer, I'm a practicing lawyer. Right. Sometimes we have to deal with much of facts, and even more, we have to analyze them. So, in this type of situation, I cannot write shortly. And my question is should be this case treated like exception? from the rule number one, to write a short, because uh, I cannot write. I have an answer and a suggestion. <laughs> uh, my, my, my answer is, knit. Even if the brief, even if you have a, 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 a very, very long, complicated set of facts to deal with, still, shorter is better. Uh, but, if you have a, here's, here's my suggestion, and perhaps this should be one of the rules. My suggestion is if you've got a long uh, statement of facts, a long a mass of facts to deal with before, before you even get to the legal issue, whatever it is, organization, how you, the subdivisions, headings, and subheadings make, can make all the difference. Uh, rather than just page after page after page and paragraph after paragraph, uh, if you break it up with headings and subheadings, mm -hmm. so that the reader knows, okay, this is this is what's next, this is what's next, this is what's next, then the reader won't get as impatient because the reader understands from the headings and from the subheadings. Well, this is why this is important, even though it's law. This is why this is important. So my suggestion to you is that in in those cases where there is a long mass of facts that you've just got to work through, then how you organize it how you break it down and how you separate it by headings and subheadings can make all the difference. I would invite my colleagues to uh, comment on that if, if uh, I could give your suggestions. If, if, yes, sir. If I may, I'm ready to make sir. Erasmus University. Um, I liked your rules uh, very much. I appreciate them. Uh, and in reply to that, uh, particularly the first rule, um, I'm sympathetic to, to that approach. Uh, but I think it's not either or, sometimes as an academic writing, you need them both. So for instance, uh, when I read something, something happened in society, in my field of health law, and I feel the urge to, to respond, to reply, not only academic, but also in a daily newspaper, to explain the audience what it, does it mean, this phenomenon. So that is only 800 words, maximum. So a short opinion, but well argued. Uh, but at the same time, I think, wow, okay, that's for uh, a daily newspaper for laypersons. But at the same time, I would like to rethink this approach, and but then for more for uh, for colleagues. And so I need them both, even and then to afford to put into context also to explain the theory behind this this idea. I think you, you, it's not either or, but uh, in, in a way it depends on, on the audience. But also, I, sometimes I need an extensive uh, version of this approach. Um, um, but 
for the message, the key message, yes, I agree that it's, it, it should be short. Well, let me ask a question, and, and, uh, and I don't know how this would fit into to the type of academic writing that you do, much less the way uh, Russian lawyers write their briefs. Uh, how much, in terms of keeping it as short as possible, uh, how, how much would you tend to rely on putting your digressions into footnotes as opposed to the main text? Well, uh, we have a rule, but that's, uh, no, that's more an uh, anecdote, uh, anecdote for the more footnotes, the better, uh, as an academic. So two lines, uh, text, and then the rest of the page, <laughs> footnotes. That seems academic. Uh, but OK, uh, that is not accepted anymore. In most uh, law journals, even law journals, uh, they do not accept it uh, in that way. So uh, yeah, for law journals, in my country or European law journals, uh, I think the general standard is uh, approximately between 2,000 and 5,000 words for an academic uh, article. So that should be feasible to explain your ideas. And that is an approach that well, uh, makes sense. And in addition, you can uh, summarize it for an opinion. Uh, it could be in the newspaper, but also in the law journal or not. And at the same time, you have a book contribution which will further uh, explain it in, in, into more depth in that context. Uh, yeah, I, like that. Uh, I would have to acknowledge that, that in academic writing, it's uh, uh, there, there, can, there can be some different considerations, absolutely. Uh, academics that read, that read academic writing, or, or for, for that matter, other people who read academic writing, are probably not generally, as they read it, are not generally as pressed for time as a judge is with a stack of briefs. And so I think that's a good mix. Any? Yeah. Um, actually, what Andre said a little further than that, you're talking now about rule number one because it's an, it's an interesting and triggering one and easy to discuss, of course. But are your um, um, are your, your set of rules, which are very interesting, especially uh, you as a, as a judge, to hear that for me from the academic world, let's say like that. Are your rules also applicable? Are they one-to-one -one <coughs> set also for, um, let's say, for academic writing, and for journal writing, for um, yeah, maybe the, the popular academic writing to the more uh, law journal writing? Could you use your set of rules one-to-one -one on that? Uh, well, some of them more logically apply to advocacy. Uh, and uh, we expect academic writing to be objective. And uh, so, uh, and that means that you, you, academic writing might not have a sharp edge to it that, that advocacy writing mm -hmm. has, for instance. Uh, I think in, advocacy, in, in academic writing, is just as much as in advocacy, uh, it is equally essential to be correct on your facts. And uh, your facts, in academic writing, your facts can, can be drawn legitimately from a wider array of sources than in advocacy writing, where you can find to the record. Uh, uh, so, uh, in, ad, in academic writing, it's okay. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying you go off and cite Wikipedia as being gospel, but it's okay to go to websites and other online sources uh, as long as you take reasonable care to be re use reliable sources for your facts and, and obviously objectively deal with those facts. I, I think that rule applies uh, equally to advocacy as well as academic writing. Uh, I, al I also think that uh, uh, in, in academic writing, uh, if you have a proposition that you are advocating in your academic writing, which a good deal of academic writing is, uh, is to do, uh, it, 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 it's equally persuasive to deal with the weak spots in your theory head on. Uh, that, again, that, that to me is one of the most effective uh, forms of evidence uh, of persuasion, is to deal with the weak spots head on. And I think that applies equally in litigation, in advocacy, or in academic writing. So I think most of these rules apply equally. We know that we know that there's an exception to the keep it short rule, but I think most of these these ideas uh, uh, do apply equally to advocacy as well as academic writing. 
Yes, sir. I have a question. Do you know our classes at
Don't misrepresent the facts. Deal head on with the weak spots in your case. Lay it down for 24 hours, if not 48. Have your wife read it. Most of that applies, would apply equally, and no matter if you're in the United States or the UK or the Netherlands or China or Russia. Uh, and uh, so I think most, most of my 10 rules uh, probably do apply now uh, in terms of what you are expected to do by way of the order of your arguments in a brief in a Russian court uh, or that sort of thing, I'm, I'm not a good source. But I think most of what I have said would fairly naturally apply uh, in your advocacy writing in a Russian court. Yes, ma'am.
a kind of primer, if you like, on blood groups or patent law or you know, as aspects of oil field patents and technology to enable the judge to understand some of the science or the information underpinning the legal issues. Uh, so so, so I, I would support the use of tables yeah, and diagrams. Yeah, absolutely. And another good example, uh, along with what has just been said, is a few years ago in another patent case, it involved a pharmaceutical. Well, my undergraduate degree is in political science, my, and my law degree is in law. I don't know a thing about chemistry or biochemistry or pharmaceuticals. And the, the uh, parties did do sort of a tutorial with me in what may have been a hopeless effort, but nevertheless an effort to bring me up to speed. And they did present information in tabular form and other, otherwise summarized form to uh, try their best against all odds to bring me up to speed on the technical issues in this pharmaceutical case. And so, yeah, I, again, it's a judgment call, but that can be very effective. Uh, and I, I, I dare say that uh, if I'm reading something that goes on paragraph after paragraph uh, of information that I have to piece it together and see how it interrelates, when it could much more effectively than laid out in another format than the table type format or even bullet points, whatever, is just going to be more effective. Okay. Other questions? I have a comment and yeah. a question from that. Um, I'm, I'm nervous to see many of my students here who may think, who may say that you are better like that. Um, but one of the themes I try to encourage them is, is to be a lover of words. A, a lot of the skill of legal writing, for my opinion, is about um, persuading the, the arbitrator or the judge in the hands. So to be able to craft words well, and I encourage them to read broadly outside the law, good writers. Hemingway springs to mind. It's such a, a, a rich form of writing, particularly short stories, that you can almost only read two or three at once before you get overloaded. Do you have any recommendations on external good writers that would benefit from the students? So that's the, the kind of little question. The, the, the real question, though, is when there's a judge here faced with two bundles of documents, one which is well written and well crafted, and the other which is poorly written, how do you as a judge come to your judicial decision making when they're both trying to persuade you? One's doing a much better job because the writing is so much better. How do you challenge the bad writing? How do you come to your decision? That, that's a fair question. Uh, I, I consider it to be my duty to lay aside my irritation at bad writing uh, and try to, to get to the real point that's made in a poorly written brief. And uh, sometimes, if I, get, if I get 20 pages into a 30 page brief and I'm just sick of it, I'll ask one of my law clerks to look at it and tell them what they think, and then, but then I'll, I'll read the rest of it myself. Uh, but I, I think it takes a certain discipline to not be unduly affected or affected at all by poor writing, but we're human. That's one of the things I discovered not long after President Bush put me on the bench. I'm human. And, uh, I can tell you that uh, being human, it's probably not possible to entirely eliminate uh, the irritation and the effects of irritation from reading poor writing. But I consider it to be my duty to do my very best to put those things aside. Uh, it usually requires an investment of more time uh, to work back through a poorly written document and to get what's in it that's really worth understanding. Uh, and if I have to put in more time than I feel I should have, that in and of itself is a little bit irritating. Uh, but I do think that it's important to, uh, uh, to try to lay that aside so that one litigant, the litigants themselves, are not prejudiced by the poor decisions of their lawyers. I, I, I try my best to do that. I think most judges do. In a way, sorry. And sure. In response, would you uh, would you reply to the lawyer? Would you in inform the lawyer about <coughs> this irritation or uh, the writings? There, that's, there, that's allowed or not? In my 18 years on the bench, I think I have probably done that maybe half a dozen times. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to be restrained in that, but. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 there was one instance 
which is which a, a lawyer who I've known for 40 years wrote a brief. And uh, he's a good lawyer. He wrote a book this thick on civil on civil rights law. And he wrote a brief that just cut and pasted passages from his book that really didn't have a direct application to the issue before him, or at least it was not explained. And uh, I couldn't resist the temptation to say, David, you're going to have to do better than cut and pasting from your book. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I criticized him in open court, not with his client present, not with the jury present, just the lawyers, uh, because that was truly irritating to me. Uh, and maybe a half a dozen cases, yes, I, I have explicitly criticized the lawyer, uh, but I do try to be restrained in that. Uh, I think in the long run, uh, it, it kind of, it's a crime that carries its own penalty in terms of criticism from other lawyers in the firm or, or other, other checks, if you will. So I, I do try to be restrained, but yes, I have done that in a, on a handful of occasions. All the, yes, sir. Would you just like to ask a question to you as a judge? Um, as you may know, 99% of um, the decisions of justice in Russia are, um, are against the defendant in criminal courts. What do you think about that? How this principle that 99% of all people in, in the system are guilty? Well, uh, in your country and mine, both, we have a right to expect our prosecutors to bring good cases. We have a right to expect our prosecutors to bring cases that are well, well founded in fact and in law. So it should, and whether we're talking 90% or 95% or 99%, it should come as no surprise if our prosecutors are doing their job and if the investigators they work with are doing their job it should come as no surprise that the vast majority of all criminal prosecutions result in a conviction. Now that leaves the question, okay, what happens in those cases that for some reason fall into a gray area? Uh, in the United States, uh, that's what we're happy to put that in the lap of the jury and let the jury sort it out while I go check my email. But uh, in, in, in Russia, there is a right of jury trial in a good many cases, but my understanding that it's not quite as common as in, in Russia as it is in the U.S., for instance. Uh, so uh, how we would explain the result in uh, going from 95% of all cases resulting in a conviction to 99, I don't know. I do know that in Russia, the percentage of acquittals in jury trials is significantly larger than in uh, criminal cases decided by the judge. So if, if it seems to be a bit strange that the defendant almost never wins, uh, one way to, to perhaps improve the odds is to invoke your right to jury trial when it is available. And as you're probably aware, there has recently been uh, a development in the Royal Courts, now not just the Oblast Court, but the Royal Courts now have have a jury trial. It's a jury of six, uh, but it's still a jury of citizens. And when the jury acquits, the jury is telling the prosecutors and the investigators, in effect, you have not done your job. You have not adequately proven the guilt of the defendant. When the jury convicts, the jury is telling the defendant, as the voice of the community, you have violated the law and you should pay a penalty. So I, I would suggest to you that one way to work back against what you may consider to be a, a, a questionable uh, percentage of equipment is to invoke your right to a jury trial. I firmly believe that. I tried cases to juries for 29 years before I became a judge. I did not in every case agree with the jury's verdict. I, to this day, in, in the cases that I preside over in a jury trial, I don't in every case agree with the jury. But I think it's a precious right, and I think it should be valued as a precious right in Russia, as Alexander II valued it and created it as a precious right in Russia 130 years ago. Uh, next question. Uh, well, I, I first, very often I, I will read 
read an academic article just there, it's cited to me in briefs. And, uh, and sometimes they'll be quoted. Uh, and, and, and if I'm interested, I'll go, I'll go find the article and read the whole article. Uh, and, I, and this is one thing that's, that's not possible for the writer of an article to accomplish. I first of all want it to be relevant to what I'm interested in, or the issue that I, that's in front of me. If I'm reading an academic article just as general, as a matter of general interest, as opposed to because it's been cited to me in a brief, I think probably the most important thing uh, that I would, I would look for is, first of all, an opening section that will orient me to exactly what uh, the issue or set of issues is that the writer is dealing with. And then uh, with the body of the article and then a summary that concisely for the benefit of somebody who is relatively ignorant on that subject, for instance, uh, a summary that tells me what I should have learned from that article. I think both of those things are important, almost as important as, if you will, the, the core of the article. The academic writers have so many strict rules that they have to meet in order to have their article published. And sometimes it's just excruciating. And uh, even before you have your article written, you understand that you will have to uh, follow certain rules uh, of the journal. And these rules are sometimes, uh, they're just sometimes the rules that prevent me from writing what I'm going to write about. to be able to 
first of all, not fall into these grooves that, that legal writers will fall into. And you, in your brief or your memorandum, it ends up full of trite, formulaic phrases. Uh, educating yourself about how other people have written about things that even don't have anything to do with the law helps you to write more like the classical writers than like a narrow-minded legal writer. I think, I think that can really help. And that ties into a second thing, uh, and that is not only should you have reading interests outside of the law, you will be a better lawyer. Trust me, you will be a better lawyer if you have something else by way of your activities in your spare time that has nothing to do with the law that you are passionate about. I don't care if it's an organization in civil society or if it's a youth organization or if it's uh, some sort of an environmental organization or a civic organization. You will be a better lawyer if you devote some of your precious time and energy to causes outside of the law that have nothing to do with your law practice. And by the way, it may help you develop your law practice as well by the people you meet, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to make yourself a real-minded person. You've gone to an outstanding law school and you have been sharpened up into a good legal thinker. Well, there's more to life than being a good legal thinker. And uh, so I, I urge you, and, and it's, it's especially difficult for young lawyers uh, because I know as one of my senior partners in my firm said, as, after I had practiced law for a couple of years, he said, he, he told my mother, he said, Stephen has, has practiced law for four years in his first two years. As a young lawyer, that's the way it goes. So it's, it's especially difficult for young lawyers to have time to devote to non-legal causes. But the sooner you get involved in something that means something to you, unrelated to your practice of law, the better lawyer you will be. You really will. And for reasons more or less similar to widening, widening out the scope of the things that you read. How much more time do you have? Okay. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, my question is connected uh, with your first school. What is your attitude uh, to the whole three? I mean, uh, it's this number is uh, quite enough for the decision maker uh, to prove your point of view and simultaneously uh, not to feel the decision maker worried with the uh, increased number of arguments and to then uh, reduce the point of view. The rule of three. Uh, tell me a little more about the rule of three. Just the least of Giving three reasons, for instance. Uh, I, I, I would not. Uh, slavishly adhere to the rule of three, but the rule of three does tell you uh, that simplicity of organization, simplicity of argument, uh, is uh, can be more effective than and thus unnecessarily complex uh, argument. And so I uh, I wouldn't necessarily put it in terms of an inflexible rule of three, but I do think that uh, there's, there's much to be said. Uh, for the discipline that's imposed by trying to simplify your arguments as much as possible. And if it turns out to be three reasons that you're right or, uh, or what have you, then so much the better. But I don't know that I, would, that I would invariably be wedded to that sort of approach. Other questions? Yes? Uh, thank you a lot for that presentation. And uh, I, would like, uh, I would like to ask a question uh, relating to, the, to your eighth rule. Uh, according to which um, you should make your uh, weaknesses more decisive for a judge. Right. Uh, and I would like to ask you, um, how can I dissemble or mask these weaknesses during writing persuasive memorandum when I present the position of the defendant or the plaintiff? And the first words here, and then going to participate in mood for its competition. Sure. And it is very important for me. Thank you. Well, uh, one, one way to, and you're, you're speaking now of how you would do this in writing? Okay. Uh, uh, one way would be to uh, use what I would call disarming candor. And uh, uh, after, you, after the brief that you're writing or the memorandum that you're writing, 
provides the factual context that I had referred to, then very in a very unvarnished way acknowledge the, the difficult issues in the case right up front. The earlier that you confront those candidly in what you're writing, probably, in my view, the more, the more persuasive your advocacy will be. So I would say, first of all, in terms of the arrangement of what you're writing, uh, that I would su suggest that you deal uh, with those issues earlier rather than later. Um, so that you can get the, the reader to understand the merits of your case, notwithstanding the difficult issues that, that could be potentially fatal to your case. Uh, secondly, especially when you're dealing with the issues that could cause you to lose your case, uh, you have to be very careful to be absolutely correct on the facts. Uh, as I say, bulletproof in your account of the facts. Uh, and if you can't, if you can't make the facts fit a scenario that gives you a good outcome, then, then you might want to go talk to your client about settling the case. Uh, and uh, uh, but I, I would say that that uh, uh, as soon as the judge gets any sense, even on, even in your your forthright discussion of the difficult issues, or the issues that could cause you to lose the case, as soon as the judge gets any sense that you are playing games with the facts. You've basically lost that issue. You really have. Uh, and you may be seen. There's no need for you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something right now that, that uh, most judges do. Some judges will not admit, but most judges do. The first thing I look at in a brief, as I go to the last page and I see who wrote, I'm, I'm interested, I have a little mental list of lawyers who have burned me by fudging the facts, for instance. And the first thing I want to know before I start reading a brief is, has this brief been signed, written and signed by a lawyer who has burned me? That will af affect the way I read it. I'll read it much more carefully. Uh, and uh, uh, now does that mean that I'm automatically going to rule against that lawyer and his or her client? No, it's my duty not to let that in the mix. But it, most any judge will tell you that the first thing they want to know when they pick up a brief is, is this brief written by a lawyer I know to be a reliable, ethical, uh, candid, uh, and learned lawyer? Or is, is this what brief signed by a lawyer who has in some way burned me, especially if it's been on a factual issue. Uh, again, uh, only you can give away your take. And, uh, and that's something that, that should be in the back of your mind, one way or another, in every brief that you write. Any more questions? All good questions, by the way. Good questions and good comments. Any more questions? In a small sales pitch, uh, with my colleagues, we have an English language law journal at university. Most of our academic work is obviously in Russian, but we have an English language work. So we're not part of the law review, because most of our students, and we have the elite we can get today, we can speak English well. I you certainly do. They, they, my they, hands off to you. You certainly do have the good English speakers. I mean, they're really genius, they're really real geniuses to be able to work in their non-native language. Um, but, but one of the things we're trying to do with our law journal now is to use it as a vehicle to improve legal writing in English in their non-native language. And we're looking to build relationships and partnerships with other universities, perhaps your university might want to participate, where our students can work with academics from your universities, uh, from your law firms, uh, and have co-authored articles of real legal scholarship, not just chatty commentary articles, but real scholarship. So I just want to give a small advert on behalf of our students sure. to, to invite you and to ask right. you to go back home when you do and to spread the word that okay. here is a small bunch of students who are really champing at the bit to uh, break uh, into legal scholarship. Well, uh, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with you on your description of the English proficiency of your students. And uh, I, I would, I know people who would welcome it. I think that's all to the good, absolutely. Well, you have my card, you have my personal mobile, you have my personal contact. Any of your colleagues and students can contact me, uh, and we'll happily work with you. Sure, to absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions?
advert, uh, a little advert for the 20th of May. On the 20th of May, on Monday, you are going to have one more meeting with Stephen Fryatt. He is going to lecture on uh, human trafficking. And uh, again, our meeting is not going to be translated. I objected to it. And uh, if you do not know English well, just <laughs> have a few days to improve it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Of course, we all are very well. <laughs> 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 so, we're talking to discuss the new